He's alive. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's lift our hands and worship him. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah, Jesus.
has been touched by the power and by his love. I have felt so much love in this conference. Everyone that I have spoken with, everyone on the platform, there has been a unity and such a flow. We have blended our hearts, our lives, our churches together. And God is, well, I'm just going to tell you, he's pleased with what is happening and has happened. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that some of you may not know the speakers we have for next year, but I promise you, they're great. What I like is we're bringing two mothers and their daughters. Sister Barbara Keller is a singer. She is sensitive to the Holy Ghost. And Melanie Schock has a touch about prayer and the word. Oh my goodness, she spoke uh, last year at the Texas District Conference, I was there, and when she ministered the word and prayer, Sister Myers, I just, oh my goodness, and it was great. So mothers, if you've got a daughter that's in the age group, would you bring them? And let's have a mother-daughter spiritual vacation. All right? Amen. Now, I know we have a speaker that's ready, but I want to bring to you a beautiful lady just to greet you. Uh, Sister Isabel Cooper and her husband Ken are aimers. They're what we call intermediate aimers. They're the next best thing to being a fully appointed missionary. Uh, Sister Cooper, come on, Sister Cooper, is from...
Brazil. And this petite, gorgeous lady is married to this really tall, who's your man, she says. And so he has the blonde hair and the blue eyes. And they've got this little bitty girl named Janae. Janae has the Shirley Temple bouncy, curly, natural curly hair these bright little blue eyes that sparkle, and she loves ice cream. So you get Justin and Janae some ice cream from Mama M. Amen. Greet these ladies. Praise the Lord, ladies. I count as such a privilege to be here today in this conference. And what a privilege and honor uh, to have Sister Mitchell as a leader. You guys are blessed. I had the honor of having her preach our ladies conference in Brazil in March and she rocked the house. My ladies were like, where did you get this woman? I said, oh, she's something else. You guys can't but she got on the chair and she's preaching and she's doing this. And I mean, the power of God came down. It was something awesome. And when we finished that conference, I'm sitting with her on the table and I'm like, oh, Sister Mitchell. She goes, what's the matter? I said, how can I top this conference next year? There's no way. <laughs> she said, don't worry. I got a speaker for you. You see, I'm a nobody. If God can use me, he can use you. I count it a privilege and honor to be a server of my God. And to be in the mission field, it's a wonderful thing. Don't feel sorry for me. I am blessed. I am not sacrificing one thing. God is my provider. And he is in control. I love you. If you want to serve, if you want to be anything, start with submission and servant spirit. God can use anybody. If he can use me, he can use anyone. I love you, ladies. Thank you, Sister Mitchell. I'd like you to keep uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil and their church in prayer while they have been in the States. They came home for a vacation. Brother Cooper attended our men's conference to be revived, refreshed, and redeemed. And then Sister Cooper came. But while they have been here, someone, they, they have just, oh, they've got a beautiful church setting. Uh, and someone came in, stole all of their musical instruments, um, stole their doors. They had just installed some beautiful doors, $3,000 U.S. That is very expensive doors there. And they took the doors off. And uh, they just snuck in through in the night and took all kinds of things. They left them the pulpit, and they left them their chairs and their fans, but took every, even the water cooler. I just, well, Lord, just heap coals of fire on their head. And every time they touch one of those instruments, let the Holy Ghost electrify them and charge them. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And that's called righteous indignation, and it's okay. Y'all, I am so excited about everybody. All of you, you are fabulous. I listen to you sing. Well, let's give them a hand. I'm giving you an applause today. I listened to you ladies sing last night, and I thought, God, heaven is going to be, well, it's a good thing we're going to have glorified bodies and going to be able to, you know, anyway, I am here to introduce a speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Meyer... 
is a very special lady. Uh, I have had more time to fellowship with her. I was in Texas last year. Uh, she let me come home to Texas and gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to be able to speak in the district that I grew up in, in the district that I was called to preach in. And, and on those campgrounds, I got my ministerial license. So it was, it was special. The problem was I, I had family and so many friends there, some I hadn't seen in 25 years. And so we were doing the family friend thing, and I didn't get to even eat a meal with you. But she was so gracious to let me enjoy my reunion in Texas. And so having her this year, having fellowship, riding to services with her, I have grown to just love and appreciate her anymore. She is a true lady. She loves the Lord and the work of the Lord. Uh, now, I know she, I saw her copy of her book, but I brought my copy. She has one book, and it's called Celebrating Life, Finding the Extraordinary in the Ordinary. Chapter 1 is great. It's my husband's favorite. He actually read it also. And I, I told her that I've gotten so tired of hearing the cheeseburger message. But in the, the, the first chapter, how many of you are hungry right now? I mean, you, your stomach's growling. It's all right. I had cake and Coke for breakfast, and, and so, you know, I, the sugar's beginning to wear off a little bit. But, Sister Meyer, if you'll just come here and get ready. Uh, the first chapter is entitled, Visions of a Cheeseburger. <laughs> now, I want you to just close your eyes. <laughs> And think of a juicy quarter pounder, mustard, pickles, lettuce, lots of cheese on a sesame seed bun <laughs> and a Coca-Cola with extra ice. Savor it. Well, I think she's got the French fries and the ice cream for us. And Sister Meyer, I want you to go get you a cheeseburger one day. Aww. Go to Mickey D's. Thanks. It'll buy you a double cheeseburger. Okay. And you just enjoy it. I'm go Is this her mic? Yes, as I said it was Okay, on. so I'm supposed to take this one away. I guess so. I love you to pieces. <laughs> I love you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, I might say also... Yesterday, before I started my speech, I mentioned how much that we loved having Sister Lois Mitchell in Texas as our night speaker, and she was not even in here to hear me talk about how she rocked the tabernacle in Texas because she was in the bathroom unstopping three commodes. And so I told her, I said, well, now this morning I'll have to say again, ladies, Sister Lois Mitchell, your, your ladies president, made y'all proud. She did an awesome job in Texas. It was incredible. So today, about three-fourths of the way through, that message she was doing for you all, I turned to Sister Debbie Veely. I said, you know what? There really isn't anything left to say. I can just get up and say, I have enjoyed being here with you. Go in peace. <laughs> Uh, but it has been my pleasure being here. All of the committee members have made me feel so welcome. And all of you, I felt such a warmth. I have enjoyed being here immensely. And the book that Sister Mitchell was just talking about, you know, yesterday in my message, I mentioned Visions of Cheeseburgers. And I also mentioned Caleb's Caterpillars. Well, that's the kind, there are 50 stories in this book that I have written over the past 20, 25 years. And so that's a sample of what is in this book. So normally I sell this book for 15, but because I am here with you precious ladies, you've been so kind to me. If you will see me at the back of the tabernacle after church, you can take it home for 10. Now I know some of you may not even have $10 left, all that shopping over there, that fabulous exhibition center where they had all that stuff. But if you have $10 left and would like to take home this book, 
I would love for you to have it. Well, um, there is something that I would like to tell you. I know that we have spent the last two days in the presence of God and we have soared up in the clouds. I mean, we have really, all of you, we have soared up in there in dimensions, maybe dimensions where some of you have never even been before. We have soared in the spirit. And that is a wonderful thing. And I know that you ladies are going back home to the real world. And I know that what you have felt here is going to linger on. It's going to be part of your life that cannot be taken from you and you will continue to live. But somehow going back to the real world of husbands and kids and cooking and, and laundry and jobs and all of that, it's not the same dimension that we have been in here. Right, girls? Okay. So I've been thinking, what do you want to tell the precious little ladies that are going back home to the real world? Of course, they're going back revived and restored and renewed and healed and everything else. I hope that whatever you have come here needing that you have received because this has been an awesome conference. It's as good, if not better, than any I have ever been in in my whole life. Precious. So, girls, today... I want to talk to you about some survival tips, okay? Now, these survival tips were given to, by God to Moses for him to give to the children of Israel. So this was quite a long time ago that these survival tips were given. But you know what? I have found that they are very relative to where we live right now. So I want to talk about some survival tips for us that I think will bless your life. Well, we know that the children of Israel's triumphant, miraculous exit from Egypt was very short-lived because soon they found themselves caught between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's mighty army. It looked like a pretty hopeless situation. It looked like it was either going to be death by the dagger or death by drowning, you know. And you know what? The Bible says that as the children of Israel saw Pharaoh's mighty army coming, that they were sore afraid. Now, girls, I know not exactly how sore afraid is, but I am assuming, considering their situation, that sore afraid was probably about as afraid as you could possibly get. Now, some of you in here have probably experienced being sore afraid. Has anybody in here ever been sore afraid? Okay, so you know what they were feeling. I remember one time... About 3 o'clock in the morning, my husband and I felt this, uh, we heard this loud bang, this loud crashing noise. So we got up, started walking toward where we thought it was coming from. Sure enough, girls, someone with a very large foot had kicked in our back door. The back door, the door facings, and everything were lying on the floor. So... As they heard us talking and approaching, they came as far as the den because they did get my purse. But you know what? I was sore afraid. I was very sore afraid when I saw my back door laying on the floor and my purse gone. I was very, very afraid. I think I fit in that category of being sore afraid. Now, I kind of hate to admit this one, but... <clears throat> In Dallas, they had just, <laughs> this is not funny, but anyhow. Uh, there in Dallas, there, a man had come into a church there in Dallas with a gun and had shot the pastor and he had shot a number of the members of the congregation. Well, a few weeks after that, we were having prayer meeting on one Saturday night. 
And this strange man came in. And, you know, my mind is still thinking, I don't know this man, and he looks real strange. And he comes in, and he doesn't pray. He just stands back there at the back looking around. Well, normally when I pray, I like to walk around and pray. It's easier for me to kind of get into it if I walk around and clap and pray. But you know what? That night, I knelt. I never stuck my head up. I knelt down. I knelt down there between the benches, and I I never lifted up my head. And so instead of really getting in a spirit of travail, I was thinking, okay, if he starts shooting, um, what will I do? Where should I crawl in here? Now, girls, can you imagine? I was sore afraid. That man did not come in there with a gun. He didn't start shooting. But you know what? Fear got a hold of me because of an incident that had happened prior to that. And I really was sore afraid. It's not a good thing. It's not a fun feeling to be sore afraid. So when the children of Israel were sore afraid, they called out unto the Lord. And, of course, he had an answer. He always does, doesn't he? He always has an answer when we call upon him. So... In their desperate situation, God did have an answer. He did have some survival tips. So if the media man will put it on the screen, this is what he said. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore cry thou unto me, Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Okay. The first survival tip they were given was fear not. Fear not. Is very deadly. Fear is paralyzing. Fear makes your heart beat fast, your blood to rush crazy. It distorts your thinking process. It causes all kind of wild imaginations. It causes us usually to overreact. And John 4 and 18 says that fear has torment. Romans 8 and 15 says that fear brings a spirit of bondage upon us. Sometimes we allow ourselves to be held tightly in the clutches of fear. We fear diseases. We fear our children will be lost. We fear we will lose our job. We fear uh, the economy will crash. We fear terrorism. Some people even fear elevators, you know? But so this fear factor in our lives can really grip us and hold us really, really tight. But fear is the opposite of faith. And the only thing the Bible tells us, ladies, to fear is to fear God. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I am particularly fond of the word sound when it talks about sound mind. Because the word sound means free from defect, damage, decay, thorough and complete, firm and secure, deep and undisturbed. That's the kind of mind that God has said that we are to have. A sound mind, okay? We have not been given that spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. We are told in Luke that your father already knows what you have need of. He already knows what you have need of. So fear not. It is his good pleasure to give it to you. Fear not. It is his good pleasure to give it to you. Luke 12 and 7 says, 
that even the very hairs on your head are numbered. Therefore, fear not. So our first survival tip here, ladies, when you turn, return home is fear not. Bask in what you have received here and fear not. Fear not. The second thing that God told Moses to tell them was to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He said, don't sit, don't lie down, don't run, don't hide. He said, stand still. Now, standing is kind of an attitude. When a person stands up tall and straight with their chin up, it speaks of confidence and authority. And so he, they are being told here to stand. What is the other word that went with it? Still. Stand still. God always has a plan of deliverance for our situation. But sometimes he has a hard time getting us to stand still to hear what the plan is. He always has a plan, but sometimes he has a real hard time getting us to stand still to hear that plan. Stand still. I know one time... Um, my little grandson, my daughter, was trying to talk to him. He was about five years old. He was, you know, running around all over the place, you know, playing with his little toys and just busying around all over the place. And so finally, Kyron said, Sterling, come here. Stand still. Look me in the eye. And then she told him what she was trying to say. I feel, girls, that a lot of times that's the way it is with the Lord. He wants to say, we ladies love to fix stuff. You know, when, when things are wrong, we want to fix it, don't we? We want to fix everything. We want to fix what goes wrong in the lives of our children. I mean, we just want to fix stuff. And we're always working on plans for fixing things. And I feel like that a lot of times God wants to say, hey, Come here, stand still. Don't sit down, don't lie down. Stand still, stand up straight, hold your chin up and stand still and let me say what I need to say to you so that I can help you solve your problem, okay? So stand still and allow God. Now I tell you what, that's not always an easy thing to do. Now that night that that door did get kicked in in my kitchen, I was not standing still. You know, I was running, dialing 911, and then I went to the bathroom window to make sure it was unlocked in case I needed to, you know, escape through the bathroom window. So standing still is not an easy thing for us ladies to do, but it is the second survival tip that God gave to them. Fear not and stand still to hear what I'm going to say. Stand still and hear your instructions, okay? It's like God is in control. There are the things we cannot fix, God can. God can heal sick bodies. He can put back together broken marriages. He can bring comfort when you lose loved ones. He can bring conviction to lost family members and friends. God can bring peace to disturbed minds. These are things we cannot do, but if we will stand still and let him do his work, he can, can he? Let's give him praise. I thank you, Lord, that you are the healer of broken minds, of broken hearts, of broken spirits. We want to stand still to work with your plan, the plan that you have. So Ephesians 6 and 13 says, having done all, stand. First Thessalonians 3 and 8 says, for now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. The next thing they were told to do is to hold their peace. Now, it seems to me, girls, that God is asking three very difficult things here. I mean, he's told us to fear not. 
Then he's told us to stand still. That's hard. Now he's saying, hold your peace. Hold your peace. Now, I can only imagine what was going on in that camp of Israel when they saw that mighty army approaching. I would imagine it was chaos. Their people were probably screaming and hollering. Some were probably trying to give out orders. The mothers were probably trying to gather their children in close to try to protect them. It was probably total chaos and confusion going on. And in the middle of that, God said, hold your peace. I know that in our lives, all of our lives, there come times of storm and of confusion, lack of understanding, 